my parents Otis Owen, Mary Elizabeth Hanley Owen. They uh, they grew up here in the in the same uh, community, went to the same church, and they were more or less neighbors when they was growing up, and they uh, they were. Three Owens married three Hanleys. My dad married uh, one of the one of the girls. His dad had two sisters, married mothers, two brothers, and so uh, we had fifteen double first cousins at one time, and I'm the last and left. Uh, I can go back to my grandfather, John Daniel Hanley, to his father was Brown Hanley, and his mother was uh, uh, a daughter of Daniel Dozier, and Daniel Dozier's mother was a Walsh. John Daniel and Martha Ann Hudson Hanley, her father, well, James Hudson, he was he lived in southeast Georgia. My grandmother's father, James Hudson, and uh, they, he moved down close to Dozier, Alabama, and got acquainted with. That's where my grandfather Hanley and grandmother met. The James Hudson moved down to Dozier's. Spent a few years, and then later on, uh, James Hudson moved back to Georgia. We we know little, very little about the Hudsons, and that's as far back as I can go on the Hanley side. The Hanley lived in South Alabama, and uh, uh, John Daniel Hanley, my mother's father. Uh, well, they, they, his name was John Daniel, and he was known as Daniel. And father uh, 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 left South Alabama and came to Texas in 1893 and uh, formed. Uh, for a man named Harmon Loman that had been a neighbor in South Alabama that had come to Texas and bought land on the San Marcos River at Staples, Texas. My grandfather farmed the first year he was in Texas with Mr. Loman, and then he bought a, a 600 acre farm uh, south of Mike Mann. And and lived on it till 1901 when he sold out and, and moved to Oklahoma. Uh, well, he uh, stayed in Oklahoma a few years and he sold out and moved back across Red River in the Children's County and bought some land. But uh, it, it wasn't too good a farming country and he didn't do too well. And he bought a hardware store, and he was running a hardware store. And uh, the story goes that automobiles was becoming a common thing then, and <coughs> everybody wanted a car, but my grandfather didn't think cars would ever catch on that people would want to loud smelly things and they're going to stay with the horses so he uh, a buggy salesman came along and made him a real good or offer on some buggies and my grandfather tied up all his money and bought all these buggies never did it never did sell them all and he went broke uh, running a hardware store at Odell, Texas. And what did he do after that? Uh, well, he was
was getting up in years and uh, running too late since he went broke and running a hardware store. But, uh, my grandmother wanted to move down close to her daughter, which was my mother, and, uh, and, and they moved down here in 1960 and uh, built the house that I'm living in, and they've lived in for 65 years. Well, <clears throat> my grandfather, Hanley, uh, grandfather was named Daniel Dozier in the small town of Dozier, Alabama, down close to Andalusia. His name after his grandfather, Daniel Dozier, he had a large family, and they scattered everywhere. But grandfather, uh, this Daniel Dozier was primitive Baptist preacher, and he pastored Good Hope Church there for 50 years, and Good Hope Church is still standing. They're having services in it, and, and some of the Dozier descendants are still attending that church. Uh, grandfather Hanley's father, Brown Hanley, had an accident. A tree fell on him and, and uh, uh, hurt his head, and he had spasms. Seizures, and, and he didn't live to, to about middle age, and, and he died fairly young. But uh, the Dozer's mother, now Daniel Dozer's mother, was named Walls. She was a Walls, and. Uh, And her her uh, her brother Thomas Walls was a preacher, and he's the one who constituted Good Old Church there in Alabama. Well, Otis was the son of S. B. Silas Bester Owen and Abigail Jones. They had eleven children; two died rather young and they raised nine. Five girls and four boys. <laughs> Granny. My grandmother Owen was a Jones. Henry Jones was her father. He went off to the Civil War and he survived the Civil War and he was on his way home and got sick at Crockett, Texas and died there. His birds there around Crockett somewhere. But Henry Jones and Martha Jones. Yeah, we don't know anything about the Jones. But, uh, we never did do any research on the Jones. You go into genealogy, there's no end. Right. These branches just come out, you know, and, and you can just run them and run them and run them. And Silas Bester's father was Silas Bester Owen. He was a Silas Jr. His father was Silas Bester. Well, and his mom? Was Lucindy. And his father was Larkin Owen. That's as far back as I can go on the Owen side. By accident, uh, I got hold of a name. It's Star City, Arkansas. And I called up this person and asked him if Larkin Owen meant anything to him. And he said, yes. It's my great-great-grandfather. 
So I said, well, he's my great-great-grandfather, too. And we, uh, his wife was more of a genealogist than he was. When she came in, she called me back, and we talked. And I invited them to the family reunion, and, and they have come, I guess, every year nearly since that day. They're happy to meet up with the Owen family. And, uh, after they came the first time, they invited Leland and I to come to Star City, and they wanted to have a meeting of the tribes. And uh, they hadn't been together in 136 years. And uh, they had a big reception for us there at Star City, and all the tribes of Lark and Owen were represented. And I made a talk, and Leland made a talk, and we had a good time. Uh, I was, but we walked those cemeteries in that area. Lincoln County, and there is an Owen Township in Arkansas. There, and there's so many Owens there. And I, we walked some of those old cemeteries, and man, I see the name Silas and Bester. I had a funny feeling because the only Silas Bester I knew was my grandfather. But that was a very common name among the Owen Silas investors. Lark and Owen uh, lived uh, up above Tuscaloosa way back after the 1800s. Then he moved up to Tipper County, Mississippi, out east, blue, out east about 10 miles east of Blue Mountain, Mississippi. And uh, you see, we Jesse Jeffrey married Annie Hellams. We tied into the Hellams, and Jeremiah Jeffrey and John Hellams. Uh, they were together in South Alabama, and they were together in uh, Mississippi, and uh, they intermarried. And John Hellams gave two acres of land out of Blue Mountain there for a cemetery and a church. And Earl Hellams found that in uh, county records where John Hellams had done that. And he set out to find that cemetery. But he couldn't find anybody old enough and new enough that knew anything about it. It's a lost cemetery out in the middle of a forest. There's a logging road that went out that way. And he finally found an old man that thought he knew about where it was. He, he knew about that cemetery. And so Earl got him and got a four-wheel drive jeep and they went back in there about a mile off the road and found this cemetery overgrown. They just had to port the brush to get back in there to where the markers were, but there's about a dozen markers back there of some Owen, some Hellams, some Jeffers mm -hmm. buried in that cemetery. And Earl planted it and uh, all the information he could get and put it in the city library. Ripley, Mississippi is still up. And I, <clears throat> Leela Ann uh, asked me once, if they, they, they didn't know where William Owen was buried as the oldest son of Lark and William. They didn't know where he was buried. They couldn't find no place, no place in Arkansas. And I asked, I said, did William 
Owen Mara Hillams. She said, yeah, he's it. He married Helen. I said, that's where he's buried. He's out there in this Hepzibah Cemetery. And sure enough, that's, that's the way it is. And my my grand, great-grandfather Silas Bester Owen died in 1855 and uh, left a widow with with a son and a daughter. And she was a Jeffrey. The Jeffrey lived on the west side of Blue Mountain, Mississippi. And they came from southern Alabama uh, in their north of uh, Tuscaloosa uh, on the Black Warrior River. And uh, they they left uh, S South Alabama and went up to Tippa County, Mississippi and stayed there until the, the late 1840s. A Tippa County, Mississippi in 1857 came to Texas and then they, they left Tippa County, Mississippi and came to McMahon, Texas. Why do you think they came to McMahon, Texas? That I don't know. <laughs> I've wondered that myself. Why did they pick back men? But uh, uh, the Jeffrey family, uh, my great grandfather Silas Owen had died, and uh, back in those days, a widow. Uh, had two choices. She could either marry very quickly after she knew her husband or else she had to go live with the family. She had no way to make a living to take care of her children. And uh, so uh, my grandfather and his sister <coughs> It came to Texas in 1857. My grandfather was born in 1855. He was two years old when they brought him to Texas. And the last Jeffers that was to come to Texas, but that was the group my grandfather was in, my great grandmother. And, and they sent a 15-year-old boy from McMahon, Texas, horseback by himself, 15 years old, back to Blue Mountain, Mississippi, which is about, I guess, five, 600 miles, by himself in 1855 to uh, be a guide to the rest of the Owen family or the, or in the uh, Jeffrey family, rather, be a guide to the rest of the Jeffrey family to come to Texas. And we, we thought that was something to send a, a, a kid 15 years old horseback five, six hundred miles through the wilderness, not much roads, and they tell the story that he got to the Mississippi River this small ferry there and he could ride the ferry but the horse couldn't. So he held the bridle reins of the horse on the ferry and, and that horse swam the Mississippi River. All of the, all of the Jeffers came to McMahon. Jeremiah the Old patriarch uh, died on the right, on the way to Texas and is buried somewhere in Arkansas. We do not know where Jeremiah Jeffrey is buried. And see, I tie into the Jeffrey family two different ways. With Abigail Fleming, she was a Jeffrey, and, and my grand grandfather was Jesse Jeffrey, and see, my grandfather and grandmother were <laughs> And that was common in those days for 
third cousins of Mary. Yeah. And uh, see, I, I tie into the Jeffers and, and nearly all the old families in this community tie into the Jeffers some way, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, they had John Helms and Jeremiah Jeffrey had formed a costume church in uh, out of Blue Mountain, Mississippi, called Hepzibah. And uh, when they all left and came to Texas, well, the church went down, and, but they brought letters and costumed the church at McMahon. In the constitution was five couples. Four of the couples was connected to the Jeffrey family, and the other man and woman was, was not connected to the Jeffrey family. But the church of constitution, 19th of June, uh, 1852. Mm -hmm. And then in the in the constitution, the uh, Bethel Church, uh, one of the couples that's in the constitution, John M. Fleming and Abigail Jeffrey Fleming, were charter members and it constituted his home about 400 yards south of where the church now sits. And, uh, and out of that John Fleming, Abigail Fleming family, there's been a continual membership of that family. Uh, and the eighth generation is now of that one family is worshiping in Bethel Church. Well, <coughs> Dad and Mother married in, in 1908, Otis Owen and, and Mary Elizabeth Hanley. They lived in Children's County in North Texas. And uh, Dad went up there and they got married in Children's County. And <coughs> they uh, wanted the pastor of the church there Elder J. Jones to marry him, but he had to come up on the railroad train and they had a, something that caused the train not to be able to run and so they couldn't get the preacher to marry him, so Grandpa and went to town and got the county judge to come out to his house and, and marry my father and mother. Well, they, my dad had bought a 205-acre farm on Tennis Creek south of Mike Ben, and there was an old house on it and uh, barely livable, and that's where he brought his bride. And my oldest brother Judson was born in that house. And, in 1913, when they <coughs> moved out on the ro road and built a, a, a house, and three of us boys, Leland, myself, and, and Dutch, were born in that house. Road. That that house is still standing in its livable. I had three brothers. Judson was the oldest, born in 1910. Leland born in 1914. I was born in 1919. And Dutch, or oldest one, Junior, we called him Dutch, I was born in 1923. And my Oldest brother Judson, he he was working on a wind charge yeah, around top of him, and he fell off the roof and broke his back, and he was paralyzed from his waist down the rest of his life. Rode a wheelchair of 37 years. The handler did die into the Jeffrey, but see Judson and his wife Lavina Baker, they they tied into both of them tied into the Jeffers and. Jolene and Louise, that's my Judson's two daughters, 
they tie into the Jeffers four different ways. Oh. Lavina's grandmother was a granddaughter of Sarah Jeffrey. Okay. So, in Leland, my next brother was uh, he, Leland, Peggy, and his wife. They tie both tied into the Jeffers. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, well, Leland. Uh, had a very keen sense of humor, dry wit. And, uh, he was the hunter in the family. I didn't care much about hunting. My brother Judson didn't care much about hunting. Dutch didn't do much hunting, but Leland was a hunter. And he uh, passed his knowledge of hunting on to some of the rest of the younger boys coming up in the family and, and uh, he was he was he was uh, when he retired he moved back he and his Dutch his brother Dutch lived in the old home place together there for several years and Leland was working on small motors lawnmower motors mostly and he got very good at it. And I asked him one time if he ever got a motor that he couldn't get to run, and he said he never did. Every motor he ever tried to work on, it ran before he got through it. He said there was one motor he worked on, off and on for three weeks, but it finally ran. He had a lot of patience. And what were some more of his hobbies? Uh, well, he uh, he had his own setup that he uh, refilled his spent cartridges after he would empty the cartridge and farm one. He had a deal that he could recharge his uh, cartridge cases with a powder lead bullets so he and he, he turned that over to one of the younger boys to and they're, they're keeping that up uh, he tried farming here on the place but he couldn't do too good farming so he went uh, to work on the Luland Foundation at Luland for a while and then he was hard to run the locker plant at Lockhart for about 10 years. And then they hired him to go to Bishop, Texas and run the locker plant. And while he was there running the locker plant, they were selling these chemical at a manufacturing plant there at, out of Bishop. And he got a job at the, for selling these, and he worked for them. 30 years part of it, he finished at Bay City. But, uh, he worked for selling these for 30 years. And they put on his papers when he was retired that this man in 30 years had never been late to work one time. He was very punctual. And uh, he married Alta Bay Jowers, but they never had any children. Well, the name Leland, uh, my brother's name, he was really named after a Baptist preacher that lived in the age when Thomas Jefferson was president. And John Leland was a noted Baptist preacher. And uh, years ago, uh, people named a lot of their kids after preachers, and politicians, and other prominent people. Uh, and I thought his name was John Leland, but 
his birth certificate just had Leland in it. There's several ways of spelling Leland, but he spelled it L-E-L-A-N-D, Leland. He lived to be nearly 98 years old. And uh, lived a full life and got in pitiful shape, though, physically and mentally before he left. But he lived, he lived a good full life. The family is feels honored, but a young one is named in his honor. And Dutch, my younger brother, uh, he never married. He had no children. They're all gone. I'm, I'm left. Last one in the family. I married uh, Edith Morrow. She lived in the Rio Grande Valley. Well, his mother was an Alexander, and I, I don't know too much about them, but the Morrows, Ms. Morrow, Grandma Morrow, she was a Parker, and she tied into the Hartman family, and uh, the Hartman uh, came here from Germany and, and some of her ancestors was an engineer helped lay out San Antonio some of the streets in San Antonio. But Edith had uh, two brothers and, and, and two sisters, twins. And one of her brothers, Marcus, drowned. He was about 16 years old. He drowned in the irrigation canal in the valley. And her oldest brother, Joseph, he, uh, he was drafted in the Army in about 1941. And he, after the war was over, he stayed in the military. And uh, he advanced and was connected with the Texas National Guard and rose to the rank of one star general. But there, he's gone and his wife's gone. And grandmother's sisters? Grandmother. I know, grandmother, my grandmother's sisters, your wife's, your sister-in-law's. Well, they was a twin, Ellen and Pauline, and, and both have families. Pauline lives with a daughter at Austin, and her children in kind of that area, and Ellen lives at Fredericksburg, and uh, she is she's down in a nursing home. Health is not too good. She has two daughters, and uh, one of them married a doctor, and they live outside of Fredericksburg, and the other daughter lives outside of San Antonio. Well, we uh, went to the same church, and, and we met at church meetings, and uh, we lived 250 miles apart. And that's why I said I had to leave this country to fi find me a wife and one kid. <laughs> <laughs> we never did do a whole lot of courting, but we did a lot of letter writing. And, didn't do too much talking on the telephone because you didn't have good service. Had those hoop model telephones and you could hear and, and uh, didn't get very good service. So we did most of our courting by mail. And uh, we 
we we started, you might say, courting earnestly about 1938. She, she, she liked kids, and, and she always had a bunch of kids around her, and uh, they liked her, you know. In fact, I mean, she's hard to court because there was kids hanging around, you know, and you couldn't get get her off t to talk to her privately. And so and she had a good personality. And, People told me that they, they had never seen her get mad, so uh, I, I thought that would be a pretty good uh, qualification. She never got mad, but, but some folks didn't know all the facts. <laughs> well, we broke up one time. And uh, we just so far apart that we couldn't court, and so we kind of broke up. But uh, she got to thinking about it, and I got to thinking about it, you know. And, and we wanted to get back together, and we did. And, uh, and, uh, I joined the Army in 1940, and so. Uh, we didn't, uh, at that time, enlisted men in the Army did not marry. And uh, so we didn't get married until 1944. I was in, in the war in France. I was a staff sergeant, head of a section of 36 men. And, but I'd been in the war for over a year and they started a program of sending some of the non-commissioned officers that had been in the war a good while that's in the home on 30 day furlough and I took advantage of that and left my unit on 13th day of October 1944 I didn't get back to my unit till March the 13th 1945, I was going about five months from my unit, and I missed the hard, cold winter of 1944-45 in France and the Battle of the Bulge and all those bad things, and I was home, and wife and I decided to get married, so uh, <coughs> some people thought a little foolish, but People did foolish things back then, and so the uh, the army was a hard life, and really hard on military families, and, and hardly any of the enlisted men married. In fact, you had to get permission from your commanding officer to get married, and. Uh, some of the non-commissioned officers were married. Most of the officers were. We married on December 13, 1944. And uh, I brought her, after I got, after the war two was over, I, I brought her up. And uh, we moved into the house that my grandfather had built and my brother Judson had lived in it until he got hurt and couldn't stay anymore there and so we, we moved in in August of 1945 we got married and we have celebrated our 69th anniversary we've lived in the same house uh, it's been remodeled four different times. It don't look like it did originally, but part of that original house is still standing. When I got back from the war and got discharged, I went to the valley and she worked for a man named Grover Weichel at Lost Presence. She was his bookkeeper and secretary, and uh, she lived in the house with the family. And uh, I went down and got her and moved her uh, into the house we're now living in. 
And uh, I took over the farm from my dad. My dad was wanting to kind of quit, slow down, and, and so uh, he turned the farm over to me and to manage it. Uh, I bought a tractor, two-row tractor, and uh, tractors were not too plentiful, but uh, and, uh, but I, since I had been in the war, and the tractor dealer, who was a World War One veteran, said he gave me priority and put my name to head of the list. Get a tractor. So I, I tried to learn to farm with a tractor. I had dro driven mules all my life, and. and uh, Everybody was going to tractors, so uh, I tried tractor farming and finally got another tractor. My brother Dutch drove it and we farmed over 200 acres of land here. We raised cotton and maize and corn, watermelons, peanuts, and uh, those are things we used for cash crop. And we, had, we had some cattle too. And later on, about 61, uh, I decided uh, I wasn't doing too good raising cotton. Get down the land and hard to get hands to chop it and pick it. So. I quit raising cotton and I went in the hog business. And, and I, I raised hogs for about 30 years. And that was a better deal than trying to raise cotton. But Edith, uh, she had me on the farm for a few years and, and she decided she could be maybe more help by getting the job off the farm. And I, yeah, I think that was a good move. She worked away from home for about 25 years. And what did she do? Well, she was a bookkeeper and secretary. Yeah. But uh, she didn't go back to work until the youngest was in, in our youngest. We had three children, two girls and a boy. And, uh, she didn't go back to work though until the youngest was in school. She worked in Lockhart, Texas. She worked for several odd jobs, but she finally got a job at Plum Creek Conservation District that supervised the building of conservation dams. And she worked for them 22 years. Well, Diane was born in uh, 47, and we had quite a problem finding a farmer that uh, she would tolerate. She, most farmers, she couldn't tolerate, and we finally went to baby specialist and he recommended we try cow's milk and we did and we kept a milk cow at that time and she did just fine on cow's milk and so we raised the other two old cow's milk they did all right Ethan never did learn how to milk and Pauline did all the milking in their family and after they lost their brother drowned. Uh, Pauline became Mr. Mars Heifer, you know, and she she learned how to milk and help around and do chores. And well, <clears throat> Edith was when she went to work away from the home. Uh, Diane was. Well, I guess she was in high school. And, she was more or less in charge when she got home from school. Beverly and Tom and uh, Diane 
she she thought she had to boss them around, you know. And sometimes they'd take it, sometimes they wouldn't. And they'd have to call up Edith on the telephone to settle a family argument. <laughs> and, uh, well, our, we got acquainted with Don. He came with a, a couple of singers, harp singers from East Texas to a singing here at McMahon Bethel Church. And uh, that's our first acquaintance with uh, Don. And everybody called him Buddy back then. And, uh, he wasn't barren. And we was at a singing over in East Texas once and some of the ladies they they thought that Diane and Don would be a good match and so they undertook to try to bring that about, you know. And, uh, I don't know just how they all maneuvered it, but later on I told Don, I said, you may not realize that you're a victim of a female conspiracy. <laughs> I said, the, these ladies are determined they's going to get you and Diane together. And it, uh, they're still together and, and, and made a wonderful couple, raised a wonderful couple of boys. And, uh, when Ryan was small, uh, we'd go to singings and uh, I'd get Ryan and he'd sit by me all day long. He didn't do much singing, but he sat there. Didn't squirm around, didn't give any trouble. But when Owen got big enough, I tried to get him to sit by me and uh, sing, but Owen couldn't sit still very long. <laughs> he had to be up and moving about, seeing what was going on. And so there's a lot of difference in the temperament of Ryan and Owen. And, yeah, we had some we had some saddle horses. Some of them uh, they'd pitch, you know, if you didn't do just right. <laughs> and uh, one time we was up at my grand my dad's, and Owen wanted to ride the horse, and so he got on the horse, and I don't know what he did. Horse went to pitching, just going around and around the barn of pitching, and uh, Owen was hollering to his voice. Somebody come help me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he rode the horse. I, I told Owen, I said, well, you're a better cowboy than any of us. <laughs> Most of us would have been pitched off. <laughs> of course, we was, uh, we was happy that Owen had found a helpmate, a woman to marry, and, and uh, we was thrilled to death that it was taking place. And, and, and it's turning out to be a, a good thing for both of them. It's a blessing. See, the Owen come from Wales. It's a Welsh name. Jeffrey's English. Hanley is English. Dozier is French. Hmm. Doze. That's the way it's pronounced in French. Doze.